life, it turns out, is complicated. <laughs> um, so, so all the processes in life are driven by macromolecular machines, such as you see here in the replication of DNA. Um, and uh, it kind of gets tricky because uh, the complementary strands of DNA have to be reconstructed in opposite directions. And this machinery uh, kind of somehow takes care of all this. Um, these, so, you know, biology is just uh, amazing. And I, and I say that as a, as a physicist. Um, so, so these machines are molecules with tens of thousands of atoms. And uh, there's not really a good way to predict their structures. Uh, we actually have to measure them. But once we know their structures, we can sort of uh, get a feeling or get an understanding of how it is that they actually function and, and, and make movies like this, which are pretty impressive, um, but also, of course, gain an understanding of the workings of, of biology and uh, gain strategies of how to uh, um, you know, deal with, with uh, diseases and, and things like this or, or make uh, new functionalities. Now, of course, we need the, uh, the right tools to be able to do this. And uh, even the best optical microscope uh, is not uh, good enough uh, for this because the wavelength of light is, of course, just too large. We need to, to move uh, down to uh, radiation with much shorter wavelength, uh, wavelength of the uh, size of the atoms themselves, and this is uh, X-rays. Or uh, also electrons have uh, similar wavelength. Now, as we've heard in the previous speakers, uh, actually this radiation is pretty energetic. Um, it's ionizing, it uh, breaks bonds, it destroys the very structure that we're trying to uh, examine. Uh, so, th so this is a problem. So, so it's, a, it's a bit like uh, trying to read a message on light-sensitive paper. Right? So, so to read the message, we have to turn on the light. Uh, but when we switch on the light, uh, we kind of burn up the, burn up the mess paper, and, and we only get a, a brief glimpse of the message. Um, so, so there are ways around this. Right? So, so um, high-end electron microscopes uh, these days are good enough to take images where we can get these sort of ghostly views of uh, single molecules. And uh, they don't look that uh, great, but actually they are. They're, they're good enough that we can um, uh, figure out which of these molecules happen to be in the same orientation, such that they can be averaged to build up signal and uh, average away the noise. Uh, now, there is um, a, a, an issue that uh, you do have to cool these samples down to cryogenic temperatures to, to, to stop all, all uh, motion. Um, and this cooling process, even though, even though you do it fast, uh, could um, affect uh, the structures somewhat and, and uh, say in, in uh, changing the, the variability of what, what you can see. Now, X-rays, um, well, we can't make very nice microscopes like this because of the penetration of X-rays. If you try and build a lens, the X-rays just sort of pass through it. But this penetration actually opens up another strategy, uh, which is to make uh, crystals of uh, molecules and array them uh, as you know, billions and billions to make these huge macroscopic crystals. And the X-rays can now interact with this entire crystal. We shine light, X-ray light onto it and uh, form this uh, interesting pattern of uh, scattered waves, uh, which actually encodes the structure. But again, this crystallization process kind of constrains right, what, what the molecules uh, are doing. So, so it's even more constraining than, than just uh, freezing them. Um, so actually, I've kind of spent the last 18 years of my life uh, looking for or working on an alternative, the third way of kind of beating this uh, radiation damage problem, which is to use a very intense and very short X-ray flash, uh, which, uh, you know, we do flash photography, and then we can uh, examine this, this message, this image, uh, as, as, as we like. So how fast is fast enough? 
we need to essentially freeze the motions of atoms at the atomic scale, uh, which is femtoseconds. So 10 to the minus 15 of a second. Um, and so, so that is a billion times faster than the, the picture uh, taken here, the flash photograph here, which was taken with a microsecond flash, which was fast enough to, to stop a speeding bullet. So we need to go a billion times uh, faster than that. So now uh, we actually have you know, the, the, the flash bulb that can do this. Um, and it's a machine, it's a big machine uh, in, uh, in Hamburg uh, called the European XFEL, the European X-ray Free Electron Laser. And uh, this uh, starts at the DAISY campus. It's a long linear accelerator. We need to, to get such high power, uh, a lot of X-rays in a short amount of time requires an accelerator like this one. Uh, and it ends up you know, three kilometers away in the neighboring state of Schleswig-Holstein, uh, where we can uh, do the experiments. <laughs> uh, so this is a, 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 you know, a, over a billion euro uh, facility. Um, managed and, and a, a cooperative uh, project with uh, many countries. So in this uh, experiments, we wish to flow uh, our molecules uh, across the beam and, and kind of zap them. Of course, once we've zapped a molecule, it's gone, uh, even though we've gotten the information before that happens. And so we need to, to constantly replenish uh, the sample. And so... Um, Again, like in the case of the crystal, we wish to uh, look at the scattered light, X-ray light from now these uh, single molecules, and uh, because this encodes uh, the structure. Um, and I wanted to, I would like to demonstrate to you how this, um, how this, uh, how we can decode uh, such patterns. And uh, so I brought along. I'm not uh, brought along my own version of the European XFEL. It's um, a laser pointer. Uh, so, so I wanted to demonstrate uh, X-ray diffraction in, uh, with this laser pointer. But I, what I didn't factor in, uh, so coming from Hamburg, I didn't factor in the sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll see if this works. Now, when you get a light from a small object, it uh, makes a, a wave that sort of emanates out, right, like a spherical wave. Um, and if we have two uh, objects close to each other, like uh, these two kind of slits, uh, you'll have two waves. So just like ripples on the pond, you'll have these two waves emanating out. And where the waves arrive at the screen uh, together, they'll, um, they'll enhance. And where they arrive out of step, they'll actually cancel each other out. It's just like in uh, noise-canceling headphones. Uh, so, so I hope this works. It's a... It's maybe you don't see it too <laughs> too well. <laughs> okay, um, so so you see a kind of uh, band structure. I'll just try this one. This one oh, might be a bit better. Um, okay, if I bring it closer, do you see that? You can see these dark uh, shadows. So, so so that's where the the light is cancelling each other out. And um, so the interesting thing here is when we um, increase the distance of these two waves, the band structure actually decreases, right? So, so there's actually a, this interesting uh, reciprocal relationship between uh, the structure and the diffraction. So, so we can actually measure the size of these, these uh, slits. And I could tell from that that it's about uh, 10 wavelengths between the, the two slits. So that's about one tenth or even almost a twentieth of the width of a human hair. And we could just see that, right, with our naked eyes. So, so now I have something a bit more complicated. Um, I'd like to try that one. Uh, so maybe you can see that. I don't know. OK. <laughs> so, so there, there was uh, lots of different um, uh, directions of, and, and periods and, and things like this. Uh, so it seems a, a lot more complicated. Uh, Actually, let's see. Maybe oh, you can't even see this one. Um, so, so, but even though it's more complicated, the principles are just the same. So, pairs of objects in this pattern uh, form uh, essentially what we call fringe patterns or or sinusoidal patterns. And uh, 
and a single sort of fringe in this complicated pattern um, is, is much like a, a pure tone in a cacophony of sound. And the way we can analyze it is just the same as in audio, right? We can just look at the spectrum. Um, and so here's the spectrum of that uh, pattern. And it's now as uh, two dimensions, because we've got sort of left-right frequencies and up-down frequencies. So, so the frequency is, is how fine these, these fringes are uh, showing up on the, on this, on the screen. And uh, what we saw is that the, the high frequencies, those further away from the axis, were due to objects that were further apart from each other. So as we move things farther apart, our fr frequencies get, get, get larger. And so, so what this pattern actually is, is a map of kind of all the, all the interparticle directions um, and, uh, and distances. So, so it's like at a dinner party, um, and you're all raising your glasses, and you want to sort of, you know, uh, clink your glasses with everyone else. So it's, it's, this is a map of all the different ways glasses can be clinked together in this, but, which is good. And, uh, but what we want to know, of course, is the seating plan of, of where these uh, people are. And so essentially, we need to find the network of points uh, that uh, gives rise to this list of connections. Um, and so, so this is what it looks like. Here are the network of, of points, and, and we can actually solve this um, because there are less points than the number of connections between all the points. So we've got it's an overdetermined uh, data set. And just uh, to make it a bit clearer, uh, so what we were looking at there in that sort of famous cross diffraction pattern was, was the, the double helix. Okay, <laughs> so that was great. We've got uh, now a way to decode these patterns. We've got uh, extremely strong uh, flashes of x-rays, but we've got these tiny, tiny molecules uh, which we're uh, trying to diffract from, and, and so the, the patterns themselves are still extremely weak and, and hard to, to, to work with. And so we'll need to, to use, or we're using the same tricks as in electron microscopy, which is to take lots and lots of data and try and uh, average patterns together. But we need to just average the ones that happen to be in the same orientation. And then uh, we need to figure out uh, how those orientations all relate to each other. Um, so we need to sort of fit these things together in, as a three-dimensional kind of jigsaw puzzle. And then we can do this uh, spectral analysis. And from there, uh, gain the structure. So this is, you know, this is good, um, but this and this is uh, actually many terabytes of data then. And uh, at the European FVL, we can collect that data thousands of pulses per second. Uh, so, so we can really suck all this in. Uh, but our ambitions don't really end there. Actually, this is just the beginning. So, so what this large data set would allow, um, and given that we're looking now at, at structures at, at room temperature, uh, is that we would be able to perhaps uh, map out not only sort of just orientations of objects, but, but also uh, different conformations, uh, different shapes that the molecules can adopt to, and sort of map out a whole, um, a whole a landscape of these, of these uh, conformations. And then from this, try and determine how they all relate to each other. Uh, to get uh, a sort of dynamic information uh, just by looking at how often we see particular structures. And it's, it's actually the, the more data we have, the better, uh, because then we would be able to pick out some really rare events. Um, and these are rare because they're energetically unfavorable, right? So, so it's like in the transition between two stable structures, you'll have a very uh, sort of, you have a, a, a uh, yeah, you have this transition. And it's these transitions, these rare events, which really guide or tell you how a, a reaction takes place and, and how this uh, structure is doing what it's doing. So that's then the vision <laughs> um, of what we want to do. And you see it, it's quite, uh, there's a lot of uh, challenges here, and this, this is really the, the opportunity of the European XFEL. And... Um, and I'd like to kind of use this forum here to appeal to all these uh, people that you know, are doing machine learning or doing biology or doing optics uh, to, to sort of come to DAISY, come to the European XFEL 
and uh, join in, bring your expertise, because uh, uh, we really need you, um, and it'll be great to, to see you there. So thanks very much.